Thank you for tuning in to Cop with Comic. I'm Brian Cop, and we're with comic Kevin Escobar. Kevin Escobar, how the hell are you? Hey, how's it going, man? All good. Oh it's, oh, it's good. Yeah, thank you so much for coming on. I know I follow you both on Twitter and Instagram. You are sarcastic arepa. <laughs> if you say it with a weird accent, it sounds something bad, but it's uh, yes. sarcastic yeah. arepa. Yeah, I'll say it. Arepa. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, the English people should say arepa, just like dumbasses, because it uh, doesn't sound as much like arepa. Uh, but yeah, yeah so it, it, you do it. Yeah, you do a twice a twice weekly open mic, which is in Spanish and English. Uh, yeah, we. Uh, if you some people don't know what Spanglish means, apparently. So <laughs> when they read that, they're like, "Oh, is this only Spanish?" I'm like, "No." So I just have to indicate English, Spanish open mic on Instagram. You know. And so you just have both both types of comics, like the, you know anybody can come on the open mic, you know even if they're speaking Spanish or English. Yeah, it, it's opened us up a lot because we've met a lot of people in South America, and we would never would have done this otherwise. You know that that's cool. It's going to make it so much easier to tour, right? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, if the world opens up, but you know, for now, thank you, coronavirus. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, you know, leave it to comedians to have the hustle to turn lemons into lemonade. Like, you know, you uh, guys, I think you guys and porn stars are the first ones to turn the technology into something that works for you. Yeah, yeah, there you go. And so, yeah, you, you, you translated it for me as jokes without borders, but in Spanish, it's something like bromitas sin barreras. Is that right? <laughs> yeah, that's close enough. It's uh, bromitas sin barreras. Oh man, you sound fucking you sound fucking great when you say that, man. <laughs> yeah, that's that's what the ladies tell me. Yeah, yeah, and then like you know, are you finding that you know any of the the English speaking female comedians on your mics are like, man, they're starting to uh, they're starting to come on to Kevin Escobar, man. He's funny, but also he's he's fucking he's got the beautiful language. I always have to indicate that I I I'm engaged with. Uh, uh, <laughs> yeah, that I lose people with that, but you know that's how it is. Yeah, just say it. Just say it last, you know. Just make sure they're laughing, because sometimes those laughs might be, "Man, I really like this guy, and I'm gonna ask him out after the show." Yeah. And you're like, "Yeah, hey, yeah, wear wear a face mask on our day, right?" Mm, there you go. <laughs> I have I have beautiful blue eyes too. So. Yeah, yeah, dude. I'm getting so much love because I do too, and so I look like a badass in my mask because all I did is I cut off a t-shirt. So I got the like even dudes are like, "Man, that's a cool ass mask." And then some of the chicks are like looking at the blue eyes. I'm like, "Dude, once I take my hat off, you're going to see I'm a balding motherfucker, you know." Oh, likewise. There you go. <laughs> so yeah, yeah, so let yeah, let us know like yeah, one of the topics that we're we're talking about today is the fact that you started out as a comedian at 29 years old. And and for me, I think that that might have been when I I think I did a stand up in in Chicago. I did it a couple times in New York City. I, I don't think I had the hustle to go around to 15 open mics a week. Like, why'd you start late? You know, why? And, you know, why'd you get started? Why'd you get started so late? And and what comedy did you settle on? Like, did you try some things that didn't work at first? And how did you figure out what did work? I suppose having a crowd laughing helps. <laughs> Uh, yeah, um, actually, my 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 buddy John Lisman also started at 29. He told me that. Uh, yeah, he's like 30, John Lisman, 35 wow. now. Or something. Yeah, he's yeah. kicking ass. Um, you, you were on his show. You were on Mate Mornings, weren't you? Right, right, right. I I drink coffee like a real man. But uh, ah, so, so did he wake you up? I mean, was it at a totally you know, regardless of if you have tea or a coffee, I think it starts at such an early hour that you might be groggy. Were you sharp enough to 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 bring some a some a game, some a material, or were you just kind of being like, "Fuck, man, this is early." No. Early? How early is it? Eight a.m. for us in New York. It's that's oh, my early Lord. for me. Now. I, my Lord. I work from home. So, yeah, I wake up. Turn on the laptop and I'm ready for work in five minutes, I, I, like at 10 a.m. So that was are, you, are you ready for comedy, though? To be live again? Um, I mean, at 8, at 8, 8 a.m. Like, I think, you know, like you work from home. Oh, so you, you, know, no. you do no, your no, day no. job at 8. But like being ready for for John Listman's Mate Mornings, man, I would be like, dude, man, I'm not that funny right now. Or at least I don't feel funny. Like, did, did that happen no, to you no, when you were on Mate Mornings? I, I asked them what it was like. It's just an interview. So that's different emotion uh, and perspective there. So it's not like, oh, I got to get a set and at 8 a.m. Yeah. and pretend I'm awake. You know, that's way different. But, <laughs> you don't have to yeah. burn material. So that's good. So, yeah. yeah so yeah. Why, did you, why did you, like John Lisman, start at 29 or later in life? And kind of how, how did you figure out what would kind of, you know, not only work in open mics, but when you actually got real audiences down the road, like at bar shows or whatever? 
Right. So right now I'm 31. I'm only like two years in. Apparently I'm a baby. Um, so you're two years old. Yeah, that's still funny though. Yeah. Two years old say yeah, some yeah. shit, don't they? Yeah, yeah, <laughs> exactly. Um, I I I'm a engineer, uh, audio engineer for a bank, and um, one day I was on the floor, just it was dead. It, the day was quiet. I haven't been doing anything. I was on YouTube watching comedians. I'm like, <laughs> like people tell me, like, oh, you should do comedy. You know, I was one of those assholes. Like, oh, you should do comedy. All right, fuck it, I'll try it. So I just started looking up how to write, what to write, uh, what could be funny. And I just started making fun of myself. And that's where I started. And finding out how to do open mics, uh, meeting new people. And it's, it, it was great. A great new adventure. You know, it was, uh, I don't know. I would not turn back time because I've met a lot of people doing English shows, Spanish shows. Um, and I, I don't know, man. It was, it, it, it was probably one of the best decisions ever, except that the business part of it is a little... Yeah, you know, yeah. still figuring that out. Yeah, and, and, and even if you had figured it out before the pandemic, that would have thrown it, <laughs> thrown all you learned out the window. You know, I mean, I actually had festivals lined up, and I was <sighs> going to go to Texas to do Spanish Fuck. festival, and Fuck. yeah. So I, <laughs> Kevin, I think, I think Kevin Escobar was so was so ready. You could have just, I mean, the immigration material that you have during Trump's America, man, it could be done by the time you know we got out of quarantine. You know. Oh yeah, I got a bunch of that. But. <laughs> but yeah, so I mean, did did you notice like with open mics and stuff, like, you know, what are the pros and cons of it? Because I think that you know, saying your stuff out loud in front of people, even who aren't paying attention because they're waiting for their set or whatever, like, you know, while you just have comedians in the audience, you know, what are some of the benefits to it? And do you think that one of the benefits is just meeting those people, is having that peer to peer connection? You know, even if you're like that, mic sucked. At the very least, you're kind of doing so with a comedian who you might network with in the future. Oof. Yeah, open mics could be brutal, <sighs> but but again, like if you're waiting in line to take a piss, you can small talk with a, a comedian. <laughs> yeah, listen, I. But I, I loved like at first I was like you, you probably mean I'm getting it now that maybe you're talking about waiting for a you know waiting in line to piss at an open mic but also just as a metaphor that's hilarious like you can meet somebody and make a connection anywhere whether it's at an open mic or waiting in line to piss and that's probably about what an open mic is like waiting in line to piss right like there you're almost you staking out you like a dog staking out your territory <laughs> you're, mm. you're like okay this is kind of what i do generally I'm, I'm pissing on the stage here do you guys like it smell it do you guys like it too but i love it you can make small talk with if, if you're in a line to piss that's perfect but but that when i started stand up it was a complete out of my comfort zone because i'm very shy guy i'm serious at work you know i wear a suit and tie yeah. Um, I, I, I actually suffered from stage fright. My few open mics were like, you could stick a coal piece of coal at my ass and I'll shoot out some diamonds. Yeah. Uh, which was weird because I'm actually a musician too. I've been in death metal bands since I was like 16, but that's yeah. different because, because I'm hiding behind a guitar and now it's just me up there with a mic. You know what I mean? Dude, oh, no, so fucking, I, fucking hell yeah. Like I get like, I'm in a band too. And that, that music at the beginning of every episode is the band I'm in. Um, it's not me uh, playing guitar, of course, because my guitarist, you know, has been working, you know, for decades on that. But like, I don't get nerves at all when it comes to that bullshit. Right, and like, right. I was also in like argument competitions during law school, and I would also get nerves there because people could interrupt you. Like during this law school competition, uh, this argument competition, they could interrupt you at any point. There's like six of them, so any of those six people could ar could argue with you <laughs> in the middle of your set. And it's kind of the same thing as an open mic, where you don't know if they're gonna laugh, you don't know if there's gonna be a heckler in the room, and that shit makes my digestion go crazy. Like mm -hmm. like as you said, once you said ass, I was like, yeah, dude, that's the fucking problem I have. And you almost need a stomach of steel. Like that can't make you nervous. But if you're not nervous enough, are you even that sharp? Like nerves can also sharpen things. Yeah, but for for music like you, I don't get fucking nervous at all because it's like, yeah, you're you're building a wall of sound. You know, nobody's gonna and nobody's gonna speak over your amplifier, Mister Death Metal. You know, <laughs> right. right? They're not gonna inter interrupt your fucking show and be like, that was not the right power cord, man. Mm. Yeah, it's a. Uh... By the way, I rock a. a... Jeff Loomis seven string signature with a whammy bar, so it's like pretty drop A tuning. So oh shit, man! That. So you're you're fucking serious, right? Huh. I mean, no, I'm just kidding. I haven't. I quit like nine years ago because oh, okay. uh, again, the business stuff got it just fucked with me. I, I lost friends, lost a lot of money. It was just like, you know what? I'm I'm gonna finish school and get a real job and 
then figure it out. And then that's why at 29, I'm like, I need some hobby, something to yeah. just noose this tie off my my neck. Yeah, no. is that is that is that why it's going to be sustainable? Like, I know there's business things about comedy and music that suck, but the minute you have a day job and the minute you approach it approach it as a serious hobby, the pressure kind of lifts with respect to the business part of comedy, right? Like, as long as you fucking hustle and hone your craft and and do the right things about your career, it's like, you know, the shit will fall in place eventually. You know, if you give yourself ten years, right? Like do you still like hate the business of comedy or, you know, because it's, you have a day job, you're not as worried about it as you were with music. I guess both because I, the advice I've been, I've been given by comedians that are somewhat established or established is uh, just have fun with it. And the more fun you have with it, the better you'll get. And next thing you know, there's probably someone coming at you with a contract. I don't know. I don't yeah. know. But, uh, yeah. Because so if, right if you're having fun, you're doing it the right way because you know you're, you're expressing right. yourself and you're surrounding yourself with other good people. That's something that I cut Khalid Rahman. He was like, dude, surround yourself with good comedians because if they're shitty, they're going to either drag you down one or be resentful when you're more successful than they are. So so if you're having fun, you're doing it right because you're, you're being yourself and you're also surrounding yourself with good people. So I would think that's fairly good advice, although, you know, who knows, you know, what kind of contract is going to be available and when. That might even depend on the pandemic, right? Like, like Netflix has given out certain number of contracts, but at what point are people going to be sick of watching a comedian on Netflix? Who knows? Hey, I I'll email them like, hey, I could do half English, half Spanish. Like, let me yeah. know. Yeah. Oh no, you're you're far more marketable. The fact that you can appeal to two different, two different <laughs> us, you know, worlds of people. That's fucking amazing, and that's what you're finding out during the quarantine. Uh, I mean, I've I've been dabbling in it the last two years, both. Uh, right. Which, you know, I have, I guess it, I have more opportunity to do more work. Like, I'm, I do an English show here, and then I run down five minutes to do a Spanish show there, yeah. blah, blah, blah. Uh, but again, you know, I have family, I have a fiance, I have other things to take care of. And I, I'm just trying to balance everything out while having a life still. You know what I mean? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Yeah, but, but like now, but you can do a set down in fucking, you know, South America or whatever or Latin America. And like you're building out a network that you can ultimately do festi festivals down there. Right. Like, I mean, I suppose pandemic is hitting them pretty hard, too. But like ultimately, you know, these are things like, you know, the whole Zoom comedy is an opportunity to build out a nationwide and international network that you might not have done if you were just hustling to New York open mics all day long. Right. Oh, yeah. That's what I, I, I the thing I said that before. uh Unfortunately, thank you, coronavirus, but I have met so many people, so many people online. I've done, yeah. I've, I've woken up at 7 a.m. to do a show in Japan. And wow. Like, how, the, uh, how the fuck did you do that? I mean, you don't speak Japanese, right? But you just no, make, no, it's English make show. contact. It's English. Oh, contacts out there. So, like, and how did the Japanese person kind of approach you for the show? Had they seen you on, on one of these Zoom shows before? No, uh, there's a bunch of, uh, Facebook groups where people post a uh, spot available at this time here and there. Um, so you know what? Me, I work from home, so I don't care. I'm signing up for everything I can, uh, meet people, this and that. So, so again, thank you, coronavirus. I don't know. I don't know. <laughs> yeah, now, I guess the question is, you know, would you have had, had you started comedy at 18 or 19 instead of 29, do you think you would have had the hustle that you do now? I ask, you know what? I ask myself that all the time because yeah. like, would I, cause I met my fiance at 22. Maybe I wouldn't have met her. Maybe uh, I wouldn't have this job. You know, it's like a lot of yeah. stuff. A lot, but, of stuff uh, fell, I, a lot of stuff fell in place. That's allowing you to pursue it pretty vigorously now. So like you said, you wouldn't have done anything different. Yeah, yeah. But but maybe, I don't know, maybe I would have been a child prodigy in comedy. I don't know. <laughs> yeah, I had so, Alan, Alan Altman on, and he said he started pretty young, and he looked even younger. And so people thought he was even that much more of a prodigy because he looked so young. And he's like, all right, well, I'll take it. You know, like looking looking young can be helpful for so long, I suppose. Um, but yeah, who are some of the comics? Like, you know, you said while you're in the bank, you know, looking at watching YouTube because the bank was slow. Of course, you don't do that anymore. Of course, you work very diligently. <laughs> but like, who are you? Who are you watching on YouTube? Who are some of the comedians that you looked up to? Um, back then, I was watching a lot of Robin Williams, uh, uh, Anthony Jeselnik. You know, they're they're different. 
<laughs> those, those those two people, those three people, my lord, to have yeah, Anthony Jessel in that kind of you know dark, absurdist, mm-hmm. unbelievable, but kind of almost deadpan, kind of cocky, the opposite yeah. of, of Robin Williams, just being you know mm-hmm. a, a human dynamo, just a cartoon come along, come to life. And so on that spectrum of comedians, where does Kevin Escobar lie? Like where do you where do you want to be placed on that spectrum? Um. I guess back then I was looking for my similar voice, something I can look up to, I guess. I don't know. Uh, but me, I am not very energetic on stage sometimes. Like sometimes I have my hand in my pocket because, again, I'm 6'4, 220 pounds, and once uh-huh. I broke the stage. So that's a fear I have now because uh, uh-huh. of, that, of that one time I broke a stage. Here in New York, the stages <laughs> are, are little. So I have big feet, everything. So I'm just, you know, I make that a joke now. Whenever I get on the stage, thank you. That was my next joke. Yeah, 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 I got to be careful. I broke a stage once. That is hilarious. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And it's incorporating, you know, it's 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 being it, it. It's almost like you feel like the crowd thinks you're in the moment. You're like, oh my gosh, he's just kind of making this up. He's he's looking at the stage and he has a hilarious story yeah. as a result of it. But it's perfectly planned and it it works every fucking time. I would think, wow, that's hilarious. Thank God, thank you, stage. Right? It's like thank you, Corona. You're like thank you, stage, for breaking. <laughs> and do you notice that's <laughs> happening now? Like you're like, dude, now that. You know, I have this night job of being a fucking hardcore comedian. Like, are you noticing hardship in a different light? Like you kind of said, thank you, Corona. But like, if a train breaks down, are you immediately, you know, less likely to be frustrated and more likely to be like, I got to take a pen out and see what's funny about this? Uh, unfortunately, yes. I, I, write, <laughs> I write jokes every day. Yeah. Again, at Jesselneck, I have that Jesselneck part of me and also have that... Uh, Robin Williams part of me that, uh, you know, I'm trying to mesh together or, uh, I don't, you know what? I, I don't know. I have the one liners. I have the stories. I have the dark stuff. I have the family stuff. It's just whatever I see observation, family, uh, something in the news. Like I just try, that's an exercise for us. Like just write something, try to make it funny. Yeah. And and like you said, I mean, there's just unlimited delivery devices for each of the thing you said, like anything funny that comes to mind, you're like, okay, well, do I want to put this out through a character's voice? Like, do I want somebody in my life talking about breaking a stage? Or do I want this just to be a one liner where I broke the stage? Like, like, there's so many ways to fucking, you know, you know, every part of the cow can be eaten. You know, there's so many ways to kill a cat, like, like, you know, it can be difficult to it's almost like option anxiety in the dating market. You're like, well, I could date this one, but these, there's these five other ones that I kind of would like to date. Like, do you notice that the more clever you are, like Anthony Jeselnik, like the harder it is to make a decision as to how to get the funny thing into your act? Like you said, you know, well, I have stuff from home and I have stuff from work and I have stuff from my past and my culture. Like, how do I fit these things in? Like the jig, the perfect jigsaw puzzle. It can almost make it crazy if you take it too seriously. I mean, or you could just write on stage and see which, you know, which one the audience thinks is funniest. Yeah, unfortunately, since I have, I think, a lot to work with, especially my Latino background and American, and I can mix it here and there. I have yeah. like, a lot of things to the same joke, and I have to figure out which one works best, or depending where I am and the crowd and this and that. So that's more I need to think of. No? Yeah, yeah, my gosh. And the fact that they took the crowds away, you know, I mean, now you're doing it online, <laughs> but it yeah, sounds like yeah. you're about ready to bust a festival and shit like that. And, um, you know, our, you know, I think uh, Mark Norman went down to Texas for a recent set. Like, is this festival, is this outdoors to the point where they might actually still kind of happen sometime soon? Uh, I we <laughs> we actually did it a month later, but online through. Oh, yeah, it wasn't. It's, like like really come on we need to actually reschedule the real thing this is yeah uh, yeah outdoors like i think early on they weren't kind of putting two and two together that maybe (laughs) big outdoor spaces are the safest places to be since this thing is airborne you know and so you know that's why the parks are open up now and have you been um you know any of those park shows or rooftop shows uh yes but my biggest problem is is there barely any public restrooms um so so the last thing the last one i went to in brooklyn I ran to a Starbucks like four blocks away and it closed in my face because it was exactly seven o'clock. I'm like, oh shit, wow. I'm going to shit myself. What do I do? Yeah. I went to a, a deli across the street. I'm like, it's like, I, can I please use your bathroom? I'll buy anything, whatever. So I had to buy a sandwich and stuff. Oh, might as well eat. <laughs> so that, 
that dump cost me, I will never forget, it cost me fifteen thirty three to take a dump that day. They're like, we're going to make you the most expensive fucking sandwich. Uh, I mean, <laughs> no, I mean, I might as well eat, right? Might as well eat after because I'm... Oh, sure. Know. But like, but like, yeah, you know, so, if it, yeah, if it's the trade between a bathroom and a product, they're not going to be like, yeah, you can buy this fucking thing of mints for $2. They're going to be like, you're going to buy a fucking sandwich and it's going to be $85. But that's so funny. The fact. And, and, and so are you having, you know, any of those nerves, any of the stage fright that's leading to the digestive difficulties or was it just bad timing? I had a large black coffee before going there. So mm -hmm. I think that that helps or did not help. Uh, but yeah, the nervousness, too, because I haven't been in front of a crowd in oof, months four months five months whatever and, uh, yeah and this stuff is it, this stuff is inside baseball like as long as you're presenting as confident th this stuff will come as a surprise the fact that you're also having kind of stage fright or whatever and, and so like once you're out there like for me the nervousness comes before but once you're on stage you're in the moment and you're rocking and rolling is it the same thing for you because like there's other i have a buddy who wouldn't get nervous before but he should have because he got nervous while he was performing and he did shitty. So, I mean, are you noticing that the nerves leave when you get on stage? I get nervous when they call my name. And right. then those, those few seconds when I'm actually on stage, like, all right, I'm here. Might as well get it over with, you know? Yeah, here. You're, you're focused on other things. Right, right, right. Yeah, you're focused uh, on your next bit or whatever. Yeah, like what I found out recently, Hannibal Burris, his recent special kind of nailed down what I recently discovered about drinking is if you drink at all, like if you if you drink to excess one night, it will fuck up your your digestion the next day. And like I didn't put two and two together, but like that for me, like I never used public bathrooms, but once I started drinking excessively at a certain age, it fucking it, it was awful. And so like and so like, you know, if you ever find that you're running to the bathroom too much, just make sure you're not drinking you know, alcohol excessively the night before. Uh, I don't drink at all. So. Oh, good, good. Yeah, because we're yeah. getting to a certain age, man. We got to start trading these tips. You know, I guess you're you're 29, but I'm probably you know a decade older than you. So I'm, or you started when you were 29, and you've been doing it for a yeah. couple of years. So you're early 30s. I'm 31 right now. Yeah. Good, good. Well, I mean, I think that you know, you got the hustle that you need. You have the marketability because you have the two languages, and so and, and it sounds like your life is so full with the engagement, with the day job, with the cultures and things like that. So. It, you know, I think Kevin Escobar is the guy to watch in, in, in two languages. Oh, yeah, hopefully. <laughs> and so we're going to be we'll following follow you all. Yeah. Oh, yeah, all, all the follow, all the stuff we're going to follow. It's uh, Kevin Escobar. He can be found at Sarcastic Are 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 Aripa, I'll say, because it sounds like the other, th <laughs> the, other <laughs> the other thing. But probably typing in Kevin Armando Escobar could, could make you easier to locate at both Twitter and Instagram. Mm -hmm. There you go. Yeah, and then Romita Sin Barreras, <laughs> which I said <laughs> awfully, and it means jokes without borders. It's got Spanish and English comedians, and it's twice, it's twice a week. It's Mondays and Thursdays. Yes, nine p.m. New York time. Yes, and you, you said my three cats. It's meow time. Do, do your cats? It is meow time. Do your cats have their own <laughs> Instagram? Uh, yeah, because I I had this running joke for a while that there's all these fucking cats on the internet making money or getting sponsored or something. I, I'm trying to get into this. So I'm like, oh, I, so when I'm on stage, I'm like, oh, by the way, check out my cat's Instagram. I'm trying to make them famous because they got to start paying some bills out here. So, ah, <laughs> I love sometimes these pet projects, though, so, you know, pun intended. Some of the times these pet accounts could be more famous than their owners, man. I had uh, Alan Allman on and he has a he's an account, account where he draws clouds. And he's, hmm. he says that has a thousand more followers than he has. <laughs> Wow. So watch okay. out, man. Your, your cats are going to overtake you, man. Don't don't fucking hype them up too much. I don't care as, as long as something works. <laughs> as long as I can monetize it. That's so fucking cool. Well, Kevin Escobar, thank you so much for coming on. All right. Gracias, señor. Day.